Two days before a tipping point election, and I want to talk about an almost lost perspective of biblical Christianity that I believe must be emphasized. Uh, we clearly see cultural battles and anti-God uh, ideologies tearing our nation apart. So a stand must be made by those with deep heart conviction. A stand that cannot be lax or lackadaisical. It cannot be an indifferent stand. And I want to talk about that heart conviction or heart courage and then read one of the greatest letters concerning that kind of courage uh, that I have ever read from American history. Sadly, the last couple of decades, I have watched those who oppose Christ and his ways show more passion for their cause than much of Christianity for its cause. Except for a remnant that we have worked hard to expand, and it has expanded a remnant within the ecclesia, except for that. And thankfully it has grown, but we have much more to do. It has been seen in hinge points of history that passion and heart are or have often been courageous. And I pray that that is true this hinge moment because it will take people of passionate heart to return America to the heart of her true God-given purpose. The message today for me is not political. It is biblical. It is a kingdom message. We must be a bold, heartfelt, passionate people that make a stand in this nation for our King Jesus, for his kingdom, for his word, for his ways, for his moral laws, for his gospel, without any compromise because in the pews and in the pulpits, except for that remnant of the ecclesia, there has been far too much compromise. Cowards in the pulpits have attempted to justify passivity and even sin with progressive, woke ideologies of peaceful coexistence, even though God's word says the opposite. Some have said, you don't even need to vote. Stay out of, of governing of the nation, which shows a, great, uh, a gross ignorance and a gross indifference because Jesus said, I will build my church. My church. Church, he used the Greek word ekklesia for church. It's used 113 times in the New Testament. Whenever you read the word church, it is the Greek word ekklesia. And he used it wisely. He used it in wisdom he knew, he knew what he was saying, and he used the word on purpose. He did not unconsciously slip uh, this word from his mouth. He called it his ecclesia on purpose, and it gave far more definition than most today have understood because hireling shepherds have refused to say it. And because of that, uh, the destiny of our nation is in peril. The ecclesia in Christ's day was a governing body. It was a legislative body that determined cultural issues. It's one of the things that it did. It determined societal issues. It determined laws. And it determined who the judges were to be. Whenever those types of decisions were to be made, the populace was invited to come to the city gate and form an ecclesia, to vote on the issue with upraised hands. All citizens 18 years and upward were invited to participate. Jesus knew that. He understood exactly what that was about. He, he, of course, knew what he was saying. 
The ecclesia, yes. The ecclesia is many things. The ecclesia, yes, preaches salvation. It preaches healing. It preaches deliverance. Yes, we disciple people with words of truth. But yes, we vote. And we vote in line with the kingdom of God principles. It is a responsibility in Christ's own definition for what real church is about. The real church has a responsibility to vote. And it doesn't matter what hireling shepherds say, the king is in charge. Voting, it's one way we disciple the nation as Matthew 18 and 19 commands us to do. Yes, we disciple people, but yes, we disciple nations. That is voting. It's a Christ-given responsibility to Christians, to those who are born again. It's one way we influence the moral conscience of a nation. It's one way we cleanse the soul of a nation, and this, this nation's soul needs to be cleansed. It's one way we influence and decide on the influencers whose voices will influence our families, influence our vocations, our culture, our, our heritage. So by using the word ecclesia for church 113 times, Jesus, Jesus was saying, church, be involved. You are responsible to be involved. Your way of life will be affected by it. Your children's lives will be affected by it. Your vocations will be affected by it. And your liberty and freedoms are affected by it, including, including your Christian liberties and freedoms. There are times when the ecclesia, the true believers, it is time and oftentimes in history you will see it. There were times when they were called upon to make a stand. This election, I believe, is one of those times. We must make that stand now and we must do it from now on. This, this election is one that will decide the heritage of our kids and grandkids. The true church, the righteous remnant must stand and keep on standing no matter what. And this, I know it sounds bold, it is bold, but this includes the confronting of nominal passive religion with truth. Christians do not vote on homosexual values or for them. We are for, uh, we, we love homosexuals, but we, we, we will not vote for their values. Christians do not vote pro-abortion. We vote pro-life. And any leader who says, well, it's okay, are liars. They are deceivers. They are hireling shepherds. Let God be true. And all those who oppose his word be called liars. We are told that some 20 million evangel evangelical Christians will not even bother to vote because their church does not stand for that. It's okay with them. Set it out. Many are told to set it out, which is absolutely against Christ's definition for ecclesia. We're also told in recent surveys, if pastors would talk about it, an estimated 20% would go vote. Well, that's 4 million people, and that would be a game changer. Passive pulpits have been and are a blight to this nation. And it must stop. Dr. Charles Finney, founder of Oberlin College and, and one of the greatest evangelists in the Second Great Awakening, declared this. If there is decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public lacks moral discernment, 
The, the pulpit's responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, well, the pulpit's responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in Christianity, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in the halls of legislation, the pulpit's responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. I've been told so many times, well, my, my pastor doesn't speak out on these issues. Our, our church doesn't believe in it. What should I do? Well, without malice, leave it. Leave it behind. Because at this point, I do not believe very, there are very many in the pulpit that can say they do not understand what abortion really means and 60 million babies being aborted. And you cannot tell me that you do not understand the belief of the Democratic Party who had abortion, portable abortion clinics brought to their convention so that people could have abortions during their convic convention. You cannot tell me that they don't understand that, that sex trafficking of little children is going on. Little girls 13, 14 years old being raped three or four times and brought into our country. You cannot tell me that they do not understand that. And their silence then must be declared as complicit. You cannot say that you stand for a gospel of righteousness and not stand for righteousness. But I must go a step far further. If you support those who are silent, you too are complicit. The great supernatural era Holy Spirit is now leading, must see the true church make its stand. We must see pulpits ablaze with truth and not compromising with demon doctrines. Oh, I've read the reports. I've seen some, some denominations. I've seen the, the list of pastors that say it's okay. They are liars. We must have bold men and women decreeing what God says. We must have passionate leaders in the pulpit. We've got to have bold prayers using governing de decrees as God has commanded us to, to, to do. Not just for this election, but from here on all the time. Last Thursday was Reformation Day. Martin Luther, his Reformation began 1517. And it's a reformation still ongoing. It, it changed. It changed the world in many ways. One of his more famous quotes was this. You are responsible for what you say, but also you are responsible for what you don't say. Voting is one way we speak. Speak the Bible. Speak God's word. You are responsible to do so. Since, since man's fall into sin in the Garden of Eden, man has been on a quest to find freedom, real, real freedom. His odyssey has caused him to search the world relentlessly. He has searched the various philosophies. He has searched the various governments Socialism, communism, dictators, kings and queens, parliaments. It was that cry for freedom that brought our great nation into being in the first place. And at least our ancestors were searching the right vein for freedom. Because it was the cause of freedom that, that brought the first pilgrims to our, our shores it was for the purpose of pursuing an almighty God freely that Christians got on wooden, 
wind-driven ships like the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria and the Mayflower. Even a very casual look at American history shows that this nation was founded upon holy scripture. It was founded to be God-fearing, God-reverencing, and God-loving. It was founded by our forefathers to be a land where all inhabitants could worship God freely, however they wanted to. If you go back in time, a couple of hundred years, you will find a lot of quotes concerning liberty and concerning freedom. There are thousands of them. In fact, our own Pledge of Allegiance to the flag ends with one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, for all, all races, all colors, all. The song simply titled America was written by a young the theology student in his room at Andover Seminary in 1832. I'm sure you've heard it and probably sung it. The young minister Samuel Francis Smith penned these words. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died. Land of the pilgrims pride from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. Let music swell the breeze and, and ring from all the trees. Sweet freedom's song. Let mortal tongues awake. Let all that breathe partake. Let rocks their silence break. The sound prolong. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. Within this song you hear the cry of freedom. Within it we hear, we hear an appeal to heaven. We hear prayer for protection. We hear a declaration that Jesus is King. We hear a cry for guidance. We hear a cry for freedom, let freedom ring. No one of honest mind can deny that God, that King Jesus and his gospel, that God's word and his laws, his promises of freedom and liberty are the essence of this nation. They are the core of our land. They are the underpinnings of our government. Fifty-five signers of the original Constitution of the 55, 52 were Christians. And we now know that 97% of that constitution was based on holy scriptures and their values, 97%. It's estimated that most denominationals, uh, denominations constitutions are not that biblical. Most of us have been inspired by the impassioned words of the great statesman, Patrick Henry, he's one, he is now famous for his determined commitment to freedom. As he said in the face of tyranny, give me liberty or give me death, I'll die for it. And while that statement is freely printed, a liberal Humanistic education system or press no longer prints this one. As Patrick Henry grows on in age, having seen the nation born, in later life he makes this statement. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded up not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, plural, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not, not religions, plural. In other words, not just any religion. Not Hinduism, not Islam, not Buddhism, 
not Shintoism, no. It's founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's founded to be a Christian nation. Our nation was founded making covenants with one true God, and that God was Jehovah. However, we must admit that there's been an eroding of those freedoms in recent times. Supreme Court rulings have overruled the word of the living God on occasion. A humanistic progressive education system as well as anti-God politicians as well as a media and arts and entertainment industry have pushed satanic doctrines into the land until now, sadly now, the lies promoting and protecting an antichrist agenda are actually celebrated. The streets in many of our larger cities are war zones on the weekends. It's not going well. Our values are being discarded for worthless social experiments that have been proven wrong in culture after culture after culture. It's like we're doubling down on dumb. Great empires have fallen because they forgot their values. Ask the Romans. We are seeing before our eyes that without God, without God you have no moral, spiritual, or cultural compass. And without a compass, you are without direction. But the fools... The so-called enlightened ones have decided we don't need a compass. Man can go his own way. It, it, it will be better that way. So our history is being rewritten to exclude God by an atheist-driven agenda, and our moorings are loose. Our bedrock anchors are loose, and America is drifting. It's drifting in all kinds of different directions. It's a muddy mess. The enlightened ones call it tolerance. Jesus called it the path that leads to destruction. Live however you want. It'll be tolerated. What will not be tolerated is Christianity and its values. They hate Christianity, and they hate our values. It is despised, and it is not tolerable to them. It's amazing how those who shout tolerance the loudest are the least tolerant. If we believe the Bible, we are called bigots, racist. If we quote the Bible, we are called, it's called Hate speech. We are ridiculed, killed as being uh, illiterate and stupid. And now we are called garbage. Deplorables. Oh, it's time to make a stand. Passive Christianity is not real Christianity. It's religion with compromised standards. It's nominal. It's in name only. And it is a blight on this nation that we must confront. It's a blight to our Christian values. When I was a young boy in the 1960s, America was in another quite a defining moment, and I'm, I'm seeing similarities. There were wrongs that needed righted. There were cultural sins and laws that needed confronted and changed. There were attitudes that needed to be confronted and though I was just a young teenage boy, 
I was disturbed by what I was seeing. It was on the news all the time. And all my life, I have been one that has paid attention to social and cultural things that are happening, uh, uh, news things. And I've had to pay attention. I now know it's because I was being called to be an ap apostle watchman for the nation. But there was racial oppression. There was prejudice. There was hatred. And I couldn't make sense of it. I mean, some of my best friends at that time were black boys. I couldn't make sense of it. People were yelling and, and screaming at each other, belittling and fighting. Thousands of people got together and decided that they would be one of the ones that would would change things. They, they would make a stand. And there were a few great leaders that committed themselves to change. One of them was Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he was named after Martin Luther of the Great Reformation, 1517. Dr. King will go down as one of the greatest leaders in history, I believe. I've studied his life. I've been inspired by his life and his stand for transformation and change. In 1963, that cause led him to Birmingham, Alabama, where he was jailed for his stand. Dr. King had asked for the help of the church. He asked for the help of the clergy for the cause of equal rights. But that aid was withheld him. Much of the church and cler clergy stood by silent while he was jailed for what he believed. And then the clergy began to question his motives they begin to question his stand. So on April 16, 1963, Dr. King got some paper and he wrote a letter to his fellow clergyman from his jail cell. It was printed in the newspapers. I think it should be required reading for every American student. Should be, a, should be required leading for every leader. Should be re required lead, uh, reading for believers. I've pondered it, I don't know how many times, 40, 50 times. I've read it four times this past week. Picture this civil rights champion who gave his life for the cause because he was assassinated for what he believed. Picture him sitting in jail because of a peaceful protest, simply seeking freedom, and he begins to write, and I'll only give you excerpts of it because it's long. You can read it later, but there is so much in it that is for right now. It speaks to America today. It's speaking to you and I today. It spoke to me deeply this week. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. I want to answer in patient and reasonable terms. I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century B.C. left their villages and carried their, thus says the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so I am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my hometown. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta 
and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Justice too long delayed is justice denied. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. One may well ask, well, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what's the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or word of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with God's law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in God's word. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. Of course, there's nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evidenced sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law, God's law, was at stake. It was practiced superbly by early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience in our own nation. The Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. We should never forget, we should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal in Germany. And everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I'm sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided my Jewish brothers. If today I lived in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. Though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, <laughs> As I continue to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here, 
Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And John Bunyan, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and free. And Thomas Jefferson, we owe these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will, be, will we be extremists for the preservation of justice or injustice? I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessings and who will remain true to it as long as the cords of life will lengthen. When I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the protest in Montgomery a few years ago, I felt we would be supported by the church. I felt the ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be among our strongest allies instead some have been outright critics and opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting it. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of their stained glass windows. In the midst of blatant injustice inflicted upon the already weary, I have watched while churchmen stand on the sideline and mouth pious irrelevance and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard many Ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I've watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which makes a strange, unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between, between the sacred and the secular. I've traveled the length of Alabama the breadth of Alabama, Mississippi, and all other southern states on sweltering summer days and crisp autumn mornings. I have looked at the south's beautiful churches with their lofty spires pointing heavenward. And I have beheld the impressive outlines of her massive religious education buildings. And over and over, I have found myself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who's their God? Where were their voices when the lips of Governor Barnett drift, dri dripped with the words of nullification? Where were they when Governor Wallace gave a clarion call for defiance and for hatred? Where were their voices of support when bruised and fatigued men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of oppression. In deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church. But be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? I am in the rather, uh, rather unique position of being the son, the grandson, and the great-grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ, but oh, how we have blemished 
and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being non-conforming. There was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early church or the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed if need be. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinions. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. However, or whenever, whenever the early Christians entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and immediately sought to convict the Christians for being disturbers of the peace. But the Christians pressed on in the conviction that they were a colony of heaven called to obey God rather than man. Small in number, they were big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated by their effort and example. They brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contests. Things are different now. So often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is an arch defender of the status quo. Whoa. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power stru structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silence. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Perhaps, perhaps I've once again been too optimistic. Is organized religion too inexorably bound to the status quo to save our nation and our world? Perhaps, Perhaps I must turn my faith to the inner spiritual church, the remnant within the church, the true ecclesia and hope of the world. Sixty years ago, he knew that the hope was the ecclesia, the remnant making a stand. But again, I'm thankful to God that some noble souls from the ranks of organized religion have broken loose from the paralyzing chains of conformity and joined us in active partnership for the, for the struggle of freedom. They have acted in faith that right, that right defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. They have carved a tunnel of hope through the dark mountain of disappointment. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. So do I. So do I. So do I. With only a remnant behind him, Dr. King made a difference and he changed this nation. We are in another defining moment. And I have preached it for 15, almost 20 years. We need to make a stand. We need to raise our voice. We need to raise it loudly. We need to vote. 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 
vote, Christians vote. They confront, they confront the apathy. There comes a time when you must accept responsibility for what you believe. This is our time to accept responsibility for what we believe. If we ruffle feathers, we ruffle feathers. The gospel of King Jesus is what truly promotes liberty and freedom. We have the responsibility we have the call of God. We have the anointing of the King. We have the anointing of the Holy Spirit to stand as that remnant and make a difference. And we need to do so. We need to do so now. There are thousands and thousands of decrees in their moment. And to get them across the finish line, there's got to be a radical remnant that rises and raises their voice to birth it. That's our call. That's our call. Christians all over the nation, and some 50, 60,000 of you are going to be watching this. Raise your voice. Go vote. Talk to others that vote. And leave passive Christianity behind. Singers and musicians, come. Thank you, Lord. I want to pray over this, and then we're going to start to worship the Lord. And if you need prayer, you can come to the altars. We'll be glad to pray for you today. Perhaps there are those in this room, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Come, and we will lead you in that kind of prayer as well. Whatever your need may be, we're going to pray for you. But first of all, Let's pray for this nation. I just seeded a prophetic word into it. Let's water it and ask Holy Spirit to amplify it. Let it ring. Let it ring. Stand if you would, please. Today, Lord, we thank you for the promise of your word. We thank you that truth, when declared, confronts compromise confront it today let somehow the truth go into our nation and begin to get into the hearts of your people and that they would receive and accept responsibility to make a stand give us leaders that will rise in this hour give us leaders that have a heart Give us leaders that refuse to compromise. That make us a visible stand at this moment, this time, and declare truth. Jesus, Messiah, our breaker, take these words and break Demon lies. Demon lies in the pulpit. Demon lies in education. Demon lies everywhere. Bust it. Break it. Let truth prevail. Let the church, the true church, rise like never before. Rise. The true believers rise and raise their voice, no longer intimidated, speaking the truth, speaking and declaring your word. Empty the prayer bowls of heaven that are filled with cries for freedom, cries for justice, cries for a nation to be Reconnected to its covenant roots. A nation that is under you, God. Let it be so. Let it be so. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Exciting times. God will make a stand with us if we make a stand with Him. Amen. Amen. There are times when the Lord gives me a responsibility to confront with truth, evil doctrine. And I knew that that's what it was going to be today. I told Carol, I said, they're either going to like it or they're really not going to like it. But we will get nowhere with a passive church. And as for me and my house, as for me and my house, as for me in this house, let God be true. Amen. Okay, raise your, your faith level. Finish strong this week. Let's declare the word of the Lord. Amen. Bless you. Have a great rest of the week.